welcome to another edition of AV Rants. I'm Tom Andrew and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. Uh, so hopefully sort of back to normal for the podcast. That's the idea. However, I did foolishly do another Windows update, which has uh, completely messed up my uh, <laughs> Microsoft branded life cam. So I am oddly dark and the focus keeps going in and out. So the final version of this video is going to probably look worse than the behind the scenes version. But hey, more people watch behind the scenes anyway. So hooray for Windows updates. Uh, okay. What you looking at? My two channel amp i don't know if it's it's got a red light on does that okay. mean it's on or does that mean it's in standby it depends on the thing a lot of times it means it's standby yeah that this is the the one the date and audio one we i need to figure know. that out because it, it was red light yesterday and i think that means that my height speakers were not being powered for some eh, reason yeah. <sighs> another thing to do it's bothering me i can see the red light it's right there and it's just bothering me <laughs> guardians of the galaxy 2 my parents got on uh blu-ray is just as funny the second time as it was the first time all right I cracked my i just loved it great movie i still like the first one better but it is still a very good movie i think i liked it better the second time than i did the first time because i knew a little bit more what to expect and i'm just happy that it's on ultra hd blu-ray as all things going forward ought to be so Yes, it is. Uh, I was going to buy it, but it's like 30 bucks. So yep. no thank yes. Um, my parents are having a problem with their Harmony remote. They got the, the newest one, the Elite. Yes. And it like stopped talking to anything. I think the hub still works fine, but the remote itself won't connect to the hub. And they come to mm. me and I'm like, listen, I love you people, but call Harmony because I don't want to deal with this nonsense. And they called Harmony and they're like, they couldn't fix it. So ah. I'm like... Well, if they couldn't fix it, and I guess I'm going to... that one has I'm the gonna... built-in rechargeable battery, so... Right. Well, yes. So, so Sometimes that's just a battery problem. But uh... Yeah, it could be. Uh, we're going to have to get into this, because I'm going to have to... to they're <laughs> going to have to... I'm going to have to go over there and try to figure this out for myself. I don't understand why they couldn't get it fixed. My, they, my parents are like a black hole of mm. IT problems. Like, my dad's phone stopped working for three straight days, so he bought a new phone... And I right after he bought a new phone, his phone started working again. Of course. That's how so, it always goes. So I'm like, dude, he goes, what should I do? I'm like, you should use your new phone <laughs> because clearly your old phone has issues. But it's working now. All right, dude. You know what? You want to play Russian roulette with your phone, you knock yourself out. I'm not, I don't want to be part of that. So, uh, yeah, a lot of stuff going on over here. Yes, the, uh, the final cleanup from the hurricane happened this weekend. Now, uh, the city told us, don't worry, citizens, you pay taxes. Put all of your brush and stuff mm. on, on the side of the your yard there. Don't put it in the street because then if it goes down to the sewer, the uh, the storm drains, it's clog everything up and then we'll have flooding and stuff. So leave it on your, on your yard and we'll come and get it. They're not coming to get it. Yeah. I mean, I, I've seen them around. I've seen them getting stuff. <laughs> They're not getting mine. So my wife was like, it's killing the grass. you got to get it off of there. Uh, my dad's got like a normal size truck, not like a huge one, but like a, I don't know. What, I don't know what those are called. I don't know anything about trucks. So it's not like an F-150. It's smaller than that. So I think I took 12 loads of brush. Uh, the reason being that is if, if it had been green still, it would have all compacted down. And I could have probably mm -hmm. done it in about four, maybe five at the most. But because it had uh, dried and hardened and baked in the sun for two weeks, uh, it was impossible to get in there. And I'm all scratched up. I got scratches everywhere. But that's all done. I got these nice big yellow spots in my yard everywhere. <laughs> but uh, and the, and we could only mow because it took all day. Sa I worked on the Saturday and Sunday, and by the time we got done with it, we could only mow about half the grass before <laughs> it got too dark to mow the grass. So now I have a half mowed grass, which mm. just just so just quality. classing up the joint. Classing up the joint. Luckily, my neighbors are not doing faring much better than me, so it's fine. Uh, on that note, though, we do have a listener in Puerto Rico. I think we have more than one, but we have we have Efren, who we know quite well because he uh, often joins the hangout after parties yes. after we're done the recording session. Uh, so 
because they don't have daylight four. savings time, uh, he half the year he will join. Right, right. The other half, the, the daylight savings time is working out for him. So once I and I fully admit that you know, in my self-centeredness as all human beings are, in my busyness with everything that's going on, I didn't really think about the fact that Efron was in Puerto Rico until the hurricane was like barreling through the island. And I was like, oh my God, Efron's there. I should send him a message. And like right after I sent it, I'm like, I was reading that like, oh, the entire island has no power. Like, yeah. Jeez. Oh, so I haven't heard back from him. I am extremely worried to be honest with you, I really am. Uh, he's a great guy. He's been a good friend to the, to the podcast, good friend to me, and he's been great to have around. He's always good for a laugh, and it, he's uh, got a big smile on his face. He's got a young daughter. I know that, uh, that he adores, and uh, he's really into audio. So uh, send some good thoughts his way. Efren, if you're out there, we're thinking about you. We're hoping you're okay. And to everybody and I, in Puerto Rico, of course. And everybody in Puerto Rico. I actually have quite a few you know, one or two steps removed people that are out there. Uh, nobody that I know personally, but people, you know, family members of people that I know that and all of them are accounted for that I'm aware of, mm-hmm. but Efren is not. So Efren, hope you're out there. On that uh, note, let's get into the podcast. This is AV Rant. The podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. To get your questions answered, all you have to do is ask. You can ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. You can come to www.avrant.com. And, uh, put a comment there if you like. Uh, Facebook.com slash avrantpodcast. We're very active there. YouTube.com slash C slash avrant, where at one point our question, all your questions were, be- the videos were being posted. Is that still happening? Um, I saw episode 555 Austin got to. I don't think he did 553 or 554. Okay. And we just recorded 556 last week, so he's uh, he's a little behind. But I think he's trying very diligently to uh, work on that whole SVS project. Right, um, right. So we've overloaded Austin. So maybe yeah. you, there won't be as many videos over there for the time being, but they will eventually come back. Yeah. And I'm sure he'll catch up or whatever. Uh, you know, it's an unpaid position. It's not like it he's sure gonna, is. <laughs> he's not like he's not like he's uh, very unpaid. He's gonna get he's gonna get fired or anything. So, uh, anyways, youtube.com slash c slash av rant where you can see some of our questions being answered at times over there and the full uh, two-hour videos are still going up so those are still there's going that up. much so there's that uh let's see what else if you want to contact us directly uh, rob at av rant.com is his email uh twitter at first reflect mine's tom at av rant.com my twitter is at av rant underscore tom because i made my twitter account back when underscores were still okay mm-hmm. before they were persona non grata our uh, once again, our producer Austin, who uh, works on those videos when he's not doing this massive SVS review <laughs> that we have him on, he uh, he can be contacted at question at AV Rent because he monitors that, and he can also be contacted at at Austin T E N Pond Austin Pond. I wonder if I'm ever going to be able to say his name without saying the T E N. I don't think I am. Uh, Austin has his own podcast, the We Watch Movies podcast. I'm not even sure if that podcast is still going oh, up. Yeah. Because they, of they, they, oh, yeah, they watched it and put put that up. That was last week. So How'd they like it? I, I didn't listen to it because I haven't watched it yet, and that one I didn't want completely spoiled on ah, me. So I see. Normally I listen, but, but until I right. see it, I... Yeah, it's Wait. unusual for them to actually review movies on the podcast because the We Watch Movies podcast is not usually a movie review podcast. It is about uh, eyebrow threading. Mm-hmm eyebrow threading which is something i could make use of but never have i, I don't i don't know what it is what is it you what don't know what, I, oh eyebrow threading? i mean oh, i'm it, not listening to a podcast about eyebrow threading there's literally nothing on this planet that would make it's, me click it's on that plucking plucking your eyebrows but sort of on mass like you you use a thread there's like a whole technique you put one end in your mouth how do you know this how do you know this i know what threading is i've been to a barber's that. what I thought Even it was though like I kind adding, of just adding shoot. eyebrow hair. No. It was like put them in. No, it's or it's, maybe a doll. It's, it's plucking your eyebrows, but it's doing it with a thread, so you're plucking out multiple, you know, hairs that at a time instead seems of just one at a time. Overly complicated. Why wouldn't you just with the tweezers? It's to get you a nice like line across the top and bottom. How is that make it any better? Than... Okay, because it's a, it's in a line instead of like individual that is hairs a at a time. Stupid thing. I know this that. because I listen to we watch movies. All right, there you go. Clearly. <laughs> 
that is, it, some email comes to my email box that says eyebrow threading yep. in the subject line. I don't. That's as far as I get before I delete. I am sorry. That is it. As far as I get. Okay, I'm going to ask our listeners right here. Go ahead, and if you have uh, experience, I'm looking for a new phone because I dropped my phone super duper hard, and the speaker is torn. <laughs> like yeah. It'll work. It, I can still hear you if I keep it low, but if I turn it up high, and when it rings, it sounds real bad. So if you ever want to hear with a blown tweeter, uh, a blown speaker, <laughs> I that's, could literally show you right now. Yeah, it's more than blown. That's that's just wrecked. Well, it still makes noise. I mean, I can still understand people, but uh, I'm looking at these X is it ZTE phones, the Could Axon be. 7, I think is what it is. Looks like a uh, budget flagship-esque uh, um, You're not going for phone. an LG V30? Uh, okay, let's put it this way. I have to spend my <laughs> ba- birthday money on this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm on limited funds here. So uh, there we go. Uh, okay, let's get into the podcast. We're going to first of all start with our listeners of the week. Whenever uh, every week, we like to thank listeners who have supported the podcast in some way. We're going to start with uh, Lemuel, I believe, and Tony. Tony and Lemuel went to uh, www.avrent.com and clicked on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link. There, they were able to give us a PayPal donation. So we want to say thank you to Lemuel and Tony. Yeah, Lemuel and Tony, thank you very much for the donations. And uh, yeah, Tony did mention he 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 was like, oh, I'd probably donate monthly if if I remember to do it, or if we had a automatic contribution thing, which we don't. He he was like, did I overlook it? Like no, or something. You I'm like, I, I did we all we have? Do is you this know how much PayPal text link. they want you to put up on uh on Patreon? Uh, Patreon? It's ridiculous. Like I, it was daunting. I went over there like, well, we want you to upload a video. We want you to do this. We want you to do this. I'm like, hey, if somebody wants to be listener of the week, maybe like like pre-write it for us and help us out. Dude, and... I will give. Uh, well, I can't really give it to you. I can't give you access to. Can't can I? <laughs> no. I I did make an account at some oh, point, okay. but I I yeah that. Or you know what? Maybe I should just say, you know what? If you don't listen to the podcast, you don't yeah. have to donate. <laughs> that's <right. laughs> and that's it. That's what's up there. Just click to this, donate because this is you listen a podcast. to this podcast. Guess what? For people who want to donate to support the podcast, that's why we have a Patreon yeah, I'm account. That's what I'm doing. You know what? We're doing it after this podcast. Okay. I'm going to do it after this podcast. Many people want to spot, support the podcast, but they can't do it financially, and we understand that. So they Absolutely. find ways to support us in other ways. So we've got Blaine, who is about to purchase uh, the HSU VTF2 Mark V that we had recommended him, but then he knows the VTF3 Mark V HP, which is high power, Mm -hmm. available as B-stock for a price you couldn't resist. He mentioned us to HSU during the purchase. Now he just needs to save up for a second one. (laughs) So you can still get the VTF-2. It'll pair fine with the VTF-3. I mean, I don't think he needed it in that room, right, if I remember correctly. If we recommended the VTF-2, there was a reason. (laughs) Yeah. So now he's just got more stuff that he knows what to do with, but that's that's fine. So thank you, Blaine, for talking us up to HSU. Absolutely. Thanks, Blaine. And Nathan wrote to Oppo and urged their marketing department to send one of their Ultra HD Blu-ray players to one of us. Uh, not it, by the way. <laughs> I, you know what? I mean, uh, Austin got the SVS stuff. You got the Pioneer well, receiver that you're going to talk about shortly. So I, I think it's my turn. I should get the fine. Oppo. But you know what? Didn't hear anything via email from Oppo, so that's probably not <laughs> happening. Yeah, I could I could actually send an email to those guys if I wanted. <laughs> if, if, you, if you're really interested, we'll see if I, I can maybe make that happen. And that does bring us to our last uh, listener of the week, and that's going to be Mike, who's really more of a listener of a lot of weeks probably, because what he did is he contacted, I think he called accessories for less somehow it, certainly email if not calling but i, I think something. he talked to this guy on the I phone so, so yeah. he uh he somehow got the owner proprietor guy of accessories for less whose name is mark uh, on the phone and or through email and said you know, these guys have you ever heard that baby ready he's all <laughs> he's now the, by the way he would have been listener of the week if, if this story stopped right here. If he right. found out that Mark knew who we were, I'd been like, you're listener of the week, dude, for sure. Because <laughs> I was excited to know that Mark knew who we were. And not only that, but he was like, yeah, those guys, I know who they are. Because I hear about them from people buying our stuff and saying it's because of them. He's like, well, Tom needs a new receiver. You should send him one. 
Yep. I was like, that is a pair. So Mike uh, said that to Mark, and Mark said, well, what receiver would he like? And Mike said he would like the Denon AVR X4300H. Right? Yep, that would H. have been top of the list, yep. And uh, so Mark contacted me, or I guess Mike contacted me to make the con- connection. I was like, yeah, man, I am happy to have a new... I, I just, <laughs> I'm happy to have a new receiver. I'm happy to, you know... Whatever, just really, matter. but in the end, whatever receiver you send me, I will talk about it on the podcast. Yeah, and I'll uh, give my honest opinion, and it will no way affect how many people I send towards you. The reason <laughs> I send people to you is because your prices are great and your products have a hundred percent manufacturer warranty on them. That's right. If it wasn't for those, if you change those things, I will stop sending people to you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's really. what it comes down to. I mean, I don't want you to think that by 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 supporting the podcast in this way, I am going to change the way that I act in any way, shape, or form because I'm not gonna. He said, "Well, okay. Well, would you like this Pioneer receiver?" I said, "You know, I'll be honest with you. I have not recommended a Pioneer receivers because of these reasons we talked about on the podcast. Some of the reasons, you know, they have some weirdness." In their uh, and how they do uh, Atmos, their MCACC isn't all that great, and you know some other things. But hey, I said I, in the end, when it came, we went back and forth a little bit. I'm like, listen, I don't really care. You send me whatever you want. It's not going to affect how I recommend people to you. But if you send me a Pioneer and I don't like it. It's not going to help you sell any more pioneers. That's for sure. <laughs> well, you never know because sometimes just mentioning it and talking about the features and for somebody out there, they're like, "That's the feature I want." The thing yeah. that Tom said he didn't like. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, that's like, absolutely true. Yeah. And that's what I say a lot of times in reviews with people that are like, "Well, you said this bad thing." I'm like, "Listen." You're taking it as a negative, but the fact is, there's somebody out there who's like, "That's exactly what I'm looking for." Yeah, Why does not right. everybody have this feature? You know, so don't read too much into it. So, anyways, uh, I said, "Surprise me," and I uh, right, and then that was right before the hurricane. Yeah. So he said, "Hey, I'm just." Uh, he was actually not that far away from me physically. You know, he's probably you know a couple hours drive away. He's like, "We're kind of in the same boat." Do you really want me to send you a receiver right now? I'm like, "Nope." <laughs> <laughs> not right then. That's yeah. I. I don't think I'm gonna have a house, so I would really like to have a new receiver to rebuild my home theater from when I come home to my entire home underwater. So after the hurricane and everything was fine, I said, "Go ahead and send it." He did send a Denon AVRX 4300H. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so that's sitting in a box in the other room. Yet I, I'm, I'm still cleaning up from the hurricane. Believe me, this is high on my list of things to do. I also have to. Call, I told my wife I'm redoing the home theater. She looked at me, took a deep breath, and said, "Okay, what does that mean?" I'm like, "I'm not going to spend any money." She goes, "Okay." <laughs> but I'm going to tear this room apart and we have to go shopping for a couch because she wants a new couch so that sure. we can all sit together. So all these things are now in the works. So it's going to be a bit of a process before I get this receiver in here. But Mike, listener of the rest of the year, market accessories for the last, thank you very much for your support of the podcast. Believe me, we love your website. We love your service and it's because of the service that you provide and the fact that you support the podcast is just a cherry on the top. So thank you very much. Buffy. Yeah, Mike, thanks so much. And Mark, hugely generous of you. So greatly appreciated. And uh, hey, okay, so 4300H it is. Here, here it was. I was all like, you know, ready to hear about a pioneer. And I'm like, oh, okay, there you go. <laughs> it worked out. It worked it, out. Well, it's, it'll at, be at just the time, fine. At the time, he didn't have any Denons in stock. That's right. And now so, he does. And it actually ends up, if, if, if the price that they're selling it for is reflective at all of what it costs for him to get it in then it would be less expensive or i don't know whatever happy ending no matter what was going to happen so yeah good stuff all right let's go into the news uh rob was a guest uh a guest host i guess on the yeah. entertainment 2.0 podcast last week again they love you over there yeah. which, uh, they talked about uh, hdr arc and 4k hgpcs as well as some other niche things to do with plex if you didn't understand any of those things high dynamic range audio return channel and then htpc is a home theater pc and if you don't know what that is don't worry you don't want one uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah um if if anybody wants to check that out it's uh the digital media zone.com very important to have the word the in there because there is something else that's just digital media zone so this is the digital media zone.com you'll find the most recent entertainment 2.0 podcast i'm on there if you want to hear us talk about that stuff for longer than intended 
Because how did that happen with me I on wonder. this podcast? I wonder how that could it's possibly happen. It's a mystery. Happen. It is a mystery. Hmm. There's a common factor here. I can't quite suss it out. We need to draw a regression line through all these things. All right. The Den and Morant's Dolby, uh, the Den and Morant's Dolby Vision and HLG pass-through firmware updates have begun. And we thank Byron, our listener, for the photo. So we got the photo of that. And once Tom starts installing his X4300H, he's going to see the same screen. Yes, which will do me no good because I don't have a projector that can That's do right. any of that stuff. So, uh, and I, 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 I want to be I, guys. I want to be totally honest with you. There is a very non-zero chance that the HDMI cable I have in my wall will mm. not support this stuff. So you won't know for now because it's still a 1080p projector at the moment. But yeah, I now actually Clint. When I was at Clint's, he had an old projector. He's like, "Dude, take this thing." <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll take it. So now I've got three projectors and they're all 1080p so ah. they well if just, you are redoing the theater and rerunning that wire make sure you make it i one am that not can, going that far because that stuff, stuff is actually stapled into the joists yeah, there okay. is no there's no pulling that wire and coming back out I, if i end up having to do that i will staple something to the ceiling i might have to do the whole what you call it the crown molding crap yeah all right, we've got a couple of comments here. Uh, we have a correction from, uh, this comes from our listeners, Nathan Earl. Now, guys, if you hear us say something and we're wrong, you need to correct us because we are human beings and we make mistakes and we're not we sure above. Do. And we would rather be right than be, you know, to not be corrected. Anyways, Oppo's new Ultra HD Blu-ray players can accept a 4K HDR high dynamic range signals via their HDMI inputs now. If you remember, we were talking last week, I believe, about somebody mm -hmm. taking uh, a, a, another source that was 4K, sending it in through the back of the Oppo and then out through the front, basically, if that makes sense. Or I think it actually works the other way. But anyways, <laughs> it doesn't make any difference. It, you're passing it through the Oppo, we said we didn't think it could do that. Well, this is a feature that was added via the latest firmware update. So it doesn't support Dolby Vision pass-through uh, yet or maybe at all. So we don't know about that one yet, but it is possible to use the HDMI input to split the video and audio to the player's two HDMI output. So it can do many of the things that our listener last week was asking about. That's right, yeah. And uh, so yeah, our, the information that we said last week at one point was true. It yes. has now changed. It was a fairly recent firmware update. I just neglected to uh, do the most recent check on that before we did the podcast last week. Uh, so thank you to Nathan and Earl for uh, you know looking that up, being on top of that, keeping us honest. We want to give the correct information. I was able to put in a little text correction in the video version, but of course the majority of the people are hearing only the audio version, so wanted to make sure that we right. got that correction this week. Things change, and sometimes quite quickly, so there we go. Yep. So last week, Jim asked why there's no subwoofer graph included when you look at the results after running Odyssey on Denon and Morant's receivers. Rob got in touch with Chris Kiriakakis via Twitter, and he said, quote, I have never figured this out. They decided this many years ago, and it hasn't changed, end quote. So it's not an Odyssey decision. It's a Morant's Denon decision. That's right. decided, they decided they're not going to show you that. Yep. It's not, you know, whatever. So it's, it was it didn't it was it wasn't instructions from Odyssey saying don't you dare show that subwoofer graph. He's like that they they should. <laughs> I don't know why they don't. They just decided not to several years ago and they never bothered to change it. So so if then Gary sent us a picture of his, I guess his brother-in-law was on vacation. The place where he was staying at had some uh, interesting, to say the least, speakers <laughs> set up. So he asks, do we have any idea what these are? So God, if you're looking no. at the video version, uh, you will see these and think, well, that's the most hideous thing I've ever seen. Okay, for those of you that cannot see the video version because you're listening to the podcast, imagine if you took two very dark wood doors... Okay. And you 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 put the corners together at a uh, with maybe a, like a let's say a, a hundred and twenty degree angle, <laughs> you know, in between them, so that you know it it, it, they, it wasn't a flat, it wasn't the two doors flat, but they were kind of slightly angled in. In between there, uh, there are well, I don't know what the heck to call it. One the, about a, about a third away from the top, there is a horn connected to something that seems to be holding these two doors together. Below that is another horn about oh, a third away a third away from the floor that's actually extended out and has come some stands. And at the very top, there's a little gold thing that I can't see what it is. I think it's a barometer. That's what I'm going with. It's probably a tweeter. <laughs> it's probably sort. a tweeter, but yeah, but, the, these things get progressively 
uh, farther and farther from the big two doors at the back. So like the yeah. what what appears to be the base horn is yeah. like well out into the room. It, and it then could the, be two feet. It li- really looks like it could be two yeah. feet, maybe even more. And then the mid range horn is is also out from the the big things at Six the back. Six to twelve there. inches, I would guess. And, and then, then some. Big kind of tweeter thing there at the top there, which is more or less mounted on flush on the... Uh, yeah, and it, these are connected to some... Definitely looks like two amps, except only one of them appears to be physically connected. It does only it, Yeah, it's a little one unclear what's side going on of there. the tubes is glowing, and I only see wires going to the front right speaker. Uh, yeah, the these... back wall seems to have some... like uh, I It looks to me like those really heavy... Uh, ship like shipping blankets oh it could you ever be those things yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and they're dark and they look like uh they maybe had been on fire at some point because they're <laughs> they, they're kind it of could, it could just be like the the paper backed insulation could be that stuff no, I, it's it's very odd i have no idea what these speakers are i am certain they are the, there is a, you only need one watt to drive them to 170 decibel type of design which is why they're connected to a big old tube amp so they are uh there's a blue carpet of some sort in <laughs> that kind of runs in between them and to where there are two rows of seats each row has a seat in it and it ah, is yes, outdoor yeah. furniture yeah it, so it is that mesh backed stuff <laughs> I guess to let the sounds through. Because apparently you don't have a very wide sweet spot with this setup. <laughs> and then there is a lamp in this room uh, that is very, very tall. So yeah. Right very to the right. large. Very, very. And it looks like it was designed by Dr. Seuss. It looks like it should walk away at yep. some point. The That's left the wall is uh, windows and the right wall is brick. Uh-huh. <laughs> so. Hey, that should be some directional speakers, though. So maybe the sidewall reflections don't matter too much. Yeah, I think they're both pointed directly at your head. So, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, uh, what are those speakers? Uh, ugly, and I don't know. That's what I got. I, I don't know. I had nothing. So anyways, a while back, we had an anonymous listener who had blown his planer tweeters in his speaker. So we talked a lot about amplifier clipping, source clipping, and tried to, to figure out what had caused the scary-looking damage. So... After Now that everything's been resolved, we feel comfortable revealing that the speakers were, in fact, the Ascend Sierra 2s with their Rowl Riven tweeters. Now, if some of you out there went, oh, that that's is. exactly right, because Rob was like freaking out. So <laughs> I don't know if I would go that far, but this is not what you would want to see when looking at your lovely ribbon tweeters which is uh literally holes in them yeah so if you are watching the video on youtube you will see that there are holes in this tweeter it is yeah. uh chunky and it does not look very good but that all. is the equivalent of a blown tweeter when it's a ribbon when it's a ribbon right. it just it quite literally tears that's what goes on so a send a sent replacement tweeters at no charge and everything seems to be working just fine he added the the listener added the mono price uh monolith amplifier to his system so if amplifier clipping was the problem that should be th- a thing of the past but we just seriously sure. s- still don't know what the problem really was there's no way of yeah. knowing for a hundred percent sure but since i know we have quite a few sierra 2 uh owners out there uh i mean i i am Interested to, I mean, I I have to believe that if this were a common occurrence with this model of speaker, that we would have heard about it, like on the forums from everybody who owns them. Uh, if if like blowing these ribbon tweeters was an easy thing to do, I I have to believe I would have heard about it from more than one person at yeah. this point. But uh, who knows? I don't know. Maybe somebody was scared to say that this had happened. So I'm interested to know. It hasn't happened to mine, but then I'm in a very small room, sitting very close to them with an ATI amplifier powering them. So the likelihood of me clipping a signal in there is very very small. Um, but yeah, this was a, a setup where he was only sitting 10 feet away. There's absolutely no reason he shouldn't be able to hit full reference volume with these speakers at that short of a distance. So it was surprising. It was a little bit shocking to see, but uh, interested to know if anyone else has run into a similar issue. All right. Let's get to the questions here. Let's start with Michael. Michael is asking about Dolby Digital Plus and Atmos. He says it's rather confusing when it comes to streaming services and the new Apple TV 4K and HDMI ARC. So, he asks, first up, can optical handle any of this? 
I don't I, I don't really quite understand that question, but uh, ARC works via HDMI and te- yeah. Okay. No, because the they, alternative, right? If you have a television and mm-hmm. audio return channel is giving you issues, the normal alternative is to just use the optical audio cable. But right. he's like, can the optical audio p- cable pass Dolby Digital Plus, and can it pass Atmos? Well, it should be able to pass. I mean, it's physically capable of doing all these mm. things. All right. When it comes down to it, I mean, we we often recommend the was it the Red Mirror one? Is that the one where it's an it's a no 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 not optical. not optical HDMI optical audio toss link. No, I understand. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying. I'm saying technically optical cables can handle all of this stuff. The reason we don't it, it, we don't have it is because HDMI insists that we use their stupid cable <laughs> because of HDMI CC. I mean CC, uh, HGCP. Um, it should be able to have, handle Dolby Digital Plus depending on your TV because that's what's really the limiting factor here. But I don't think it'll ever... Ha- I mean, I don't see any reason why it would ho- handle Atmos. It seems like Atmos would be... Uh, well, I don't know. Well, it I... Should, I mean, it should be able to. It just... <laughs> yeah. It, but... Whether that it'll send it through is the is the real question. Via Toslink, um, which uses what they call SPDIF, that Sony Philips digital interface uh, audio, that's that's the only audio that you're going to be sending across a Toslink connection, you know, optical audio connection. Yeah. Uh, those those are still limited completely to two channel PCM maximum, uh, five point one Dolby Digital, or I guess you could say six point one DTS because it can do DTS ES. Right. Right. So six point one DTS ES is possible, but it will not do Dolby Digital Plus over Toslink at all. That's just not going to happen. You'll get Dolby Digital 5.1. Vanilla Dolby Digital 5.1 will happen. So if the source that you're watching has Dolby Digital Plus audio and you use an optical, a Toslink connection, it'll automatically convert that to vanilla 5.1 Dolby Digital. But it will not send the Dolby Digital Plus bitstream under any Dolby circumstance. Digital Plus on the streaming services wasn't as bulky as but it has nothing to do with the bit rate it it's a format that spdif just doesn't support yeah so it won't send it and it won't therefore it won't send atmos in any form either so toss link is 5.1 dolby digital 5.1 dts technically 6.1 dts es can also be done and two channel pcm that's it for toss link there's nothing beyond that and you can use your receivers up conversion to go to oh yeah you can up mix it with something but you won't get the but it, you're the, not going to get the signal that you can't uh, if if audio return channel isn't working for you you can't switch over to toss link audio and get dolby digital plus or atmos those just aren't going to go across at all so in michael's case he got he has a 2016 vizio m series he was using his chromecast built-in feature it's chromecast built-in feature and when he was watching netflix that way he was seeing dolby digital plus show up on the front of his av receiver yep. but with some other streaming services it was only dolby digital and after vizio's recent firmware update that put the streaming services directly on the tv rather than having to cast them from the tablet uh audio return channel stopped working altogether until he reset everything yeah. well once again, the turn it off, turn it back on solution is the first step in every IT. Yeah, this wasn't just to put it in standby and bring it back on, though. He actually had to like do the factory reset, like oh, really? reset all my settings on my TV, which means whatever calibration he did it went away. Right, reset my settings yeah. on my AV receiver. Have to recalibrate. So that's a, that's a big headache. It worked, so it wasn't that it was completely non-functional. It's just for some reason after the firmware update, it it. What what was existing in his settings no longer worked until he reset everything. So that's a hassle and a half. So he asks, can we clarify things? Uh, what can audio return channel actually do? Why are some streaming services offering, offering Dolby Digital Plus? Why others are only offering Dolby Digital? And why does Dolby Digital Plus work with some Netflix apps and not others? And how do you get Atmos from streaming services? Yeah. Well, okay. There is a... There's a lot of this to unpack, but the, the the short version, the too long didn't read version is the streaming server doesn't always have control over what audio is encoded. You know, they will support more than one format. You know, mm-hmm. if you look at your Netflix, you know, it'll say, you know, two channel, you know, f- you know, 5.1, blah, blah, blah. They'll have, you know, different languages and stuff like that. So they'll have options up there and it's not always the same thing. And it depends on how they got the 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 content some of the content's going to come with dolby digital plus and some of it's not 
So it's just going to be Dolby Digital or two channel or maybe even mono. It's, it, mm -hmm. it, it, that happens. Yeah, the the studio provides the streaming service with a file. So the studio ultimately decides what's included. Um, the streaming service can tell the studio, here are all the formats we support. Please right. pick one or more of them and include them in the file because it has to be something we support, but it's up to the studio what they actually include in the file. And the Netflix apps, well, again, aren't really, I don't think, that much control from Netflix as well. I mean, the different manufacturers have to build an app for their devices, whatever it might be, that supports, that, that, that streams Netflix. So... How well that? I mean, that's why you have all these different interfaces too, as you're going around to the, your different devices, and some of them work better than others. Uh, yeah, like right built now, in the in the case of Netflix specifically, if you want to hear Atmos, and they have a very limited number yeah. of titles that include an Atmos soundtrack, but they do have a few. Uh, but in order to hear them right now, the only Netflix apps that work with those Atmos soundtracks are the ones that are built into LG's televisions, 4K televisions, their Super UHD and their OLED TVs, uh, which is based on WebOS. That's the, the operating system that those TVs run on. So LG did the work and got Atmos working with that. And the Xbox One and Xbox One S, those can output Atmos uh, audio from their Netflix apps. Nothing else right this moment supports Atmos output from Netflix. Now, Obviously, things could. Something like the NVIDIA Shield is hardware capable of doing it. They just have to get a new Android version, Android right. TV version of the Netflix app that supports outputting the Atmos extensions uh, in a bitstream form. It can be done. That's just getting the app updated. Vizio televisions can already output the Dolby Digital Plus bitstream. It's just a matter of updating their app so that it'll work with the Atmos extensions. So, yeah, there's. I mean, there's many... Unfortunately, there's many fingers in this pie <laughs> right, and, right and and they all have to sort of converge on it working together in, in order to make this happen it, it, but it is it's as a consumer it's overly complex right you're like netflix is available in all these devices but i'm getting different audio depending on the device right. i'm using uh, very confusing right and some of those devices too are hardware limited as well the, you don't, you don't know well. how much how much processing power you know they may have just put barely enough to make Netflix work when that TV was sold or that yep. device was sold. And now Netflix has got, you know, 4K, you know, capabilities in Dolby Atmos and yep. this and that. A, a perfect example is the Apple TV, mm -hmm. which the Apple TV, if you put out a bitstream, you're going to get a 5.1 vanilla Dolby Digital bitstream. Yeah. That's the highest level bitstream you're going to get from an Apple TV. And this is including the brand new Apple TV 4K because they didn't upgrade its audio capabilities over the existing one. Um, but Apple the Apple TV can decode Dolby Digital Plus itself internally and send out 7.1 PCM. So you can have 7.1 PCM coming out of your Apple TV, which began mm -hmm. as Dolby Digital Plus on the actual file, but it... The only way to hear it in 7.1 is to have it decoded inside of the Apple TV. Now, it's plenty powerful enough to send the bitstream out. I mean, <laughs> bitstream's need... easier than what it's doing. But it's for whatever reason, <laughs> that's the way Apple has decided to do it. And they don't Which support means Atmos that on at all. On the on the right. front of your receiver, you're going to see seven channel PCM. 7.1 PCM. And that's, that's right. going to drive if, you nuts. If because that's you want what to see... you've... Yeah. set in the menus of your Apple TV, right? So it is, it's very much device by device and these things do get updated. So yeah. these capabilities change. And so far we've been focusing on Netflix because they're sort of the most clear and they detail it in their FAQs and stuff saying, here, here are the devices that support what. Uh, but this is also going to be true of Vudu, of Amazon, of Hulu, of any of these services. Yeah, It's device by device, app by app, and piece of content by piece of content. <laughs> And that it, it seems yeah. it seems like you're like what well, Netflix is the thing I should the thing should, the thing it, it's all it should self be consistent. Yeah. It's but it's not, and it's because it really they're isn't. not they're providing the content. It's up to you to provide. It's like it's analogous to you saying, "Hey, I I've got this this old TV and it doesn't look as good as somebody else's TV." Well, you've got different hardware. Of course, it doesn't look as good, or maybe it looks better depending on which side of that that room you're sitting on. So. You know, they're not the TV, the the person, the channel that's providing this, the picture, 
is saying, I can't control what hardware you have. I just give you the picture. It's up to you to decide what to do with it. That's what's happening here. There's just middlemen in between you and yeah. Netflix that are trying to get it to you in the in the way that's the cheapest for them, but you know gives you what you gives you enough flexibility that you don't complain too much. But to I, clarify, what mm -hmm. Audio Return Channel itself can do, originally, uh, HDMI Audio Return Channel had the same limitations as Toslink. Originally, it was SPDIF audio, which was two-channel PCM, 5.1 Dolby Digital, up to 6.1 DTS ES. That was the original limit. Now, some television manufacturers have got it working with Dolby Digital Plus. LG, Vizio, I think a couple other, like a TCL or a high sense or something has managed to do that as well. Um, so obviously because we have these examples in LG and Vizio, it is possible to get a Dolby Digital Plus bitstream to go across an audio return channel connection. That is just a fact. There are things doing it right now. Originally, that wasn't part of the spec. They got that working. Uh, it, but that's pretty much where it stops. Audio return channel will not pass lossless audio. So Dolby no. True HD, DTS HD Master Audio, it will not pass those things. But you can get Dolby Digital Plus. And since Atmos can be an extension on top of Dolby Digital Plus... It's possible to get that working. LG OLED TVs and Super UHD TVs can do that right now. So like I said, if you have an o LG OLED or Super UHD TV, they have the Netflix app that supports Atmos. They have an HDMI audio return channel configuration that allows for the Dolby Digital Plus with Atmos bitstream to actually come out of the television. So, but that's one manufacturer with their one application of one streaming services app. And that would have to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. So yeah, that's, that's kind of where we are with that. Now, I do want to say the Xbox One Netflix app is great. The, for the, the most part, but it's got some quirks too, like doesn't support Dolby Vision. Right. Because the Xbox One doesn't support Dolby Vision at all yet. And it will force itself into HDR mode even if the content isn't HDR. Oh, really? Well, I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> the The thing is, the, okay, so Netflix made some changes a little while ago. and We've never talked about it on this podcast, but we should at least mention it. They went from their five-star system to thumbs up, thumbs down. Right. Which I hate, like, <laughs> so much. But on top of that, they didn't preserve... Okay, two, there's a lot of things. I hate it in general. I also hate that they didn't preserve my ratings. So they ah, couldn't right. say that anything that was three stars or and above was a thumbs up. Anything that was two or one stars was a thumbs down. I mean, that's pretty easy to convert all those things, You'd number think. one. But the thing that really bugs me about it is that it does it's not as immediately intuitive as whether or not as how much i'm going to like this because it used mm. to kind of predict what your star rating would be yeah. and i usually relied on those i, I really did I, I would rely on those but now i'm like ugh. but they just i don't know if you've noticed this they've instituted the skip the intro button have you seen this oh yes yeah the skip the intro button is amazing. I love the skip the intro button. Because <laughs> if you're watching a series and it has like, the same the intro. The Walking over over. Dead always has a little thing at the beginning and then the intro and then yep. the more of the stuff. You're like, I could just skip the intro. And if you miss the skip the intro, if you press the OK button, the skip the intro button comes back up. <laughs> I'm like, oh, thank you. I almost missed that. I love it. I love the skip the My friend has Hulu. He got Hulu and he was staying at my house and he signed into Hulu at my house and never signed out. So now I have Hulu. And uh, <laughs> I was watching it last night and I was so irritated with the commercials that I'm so glad I'm not paying ah. for that crap. So, so yeah, Michael did ask about the Apple TV 4K, their newest thing specifically. We already sort of mentioned that. So out of the box, it will take a Dolby Digital Plus signal, but it decodes it internally, so there's no way to connect an Apple TV 4K right now to your AV receiver and have Dolby Digital Plus show up on the front of your AV receiver. That's not going to happen. It's right. not sending out that bitstream. It doesn't support Atmos right now. Now, for their part, Apple has said Atmos support is on their roadmap. 
whether that means it's going to come soon or years from now, who knows, but at least they're aware that it exists. Um, But I wanted to talk a little bit about the Apple TV 4K because that that was a lot of the news this week was people putting out their reviews. Mm -hmm. Um, So in particular, The Verge, um, Nilay Patel put out a a nice detailed review because he's like, there are some weird things with this (laughs) Apple TV 4K. Most of all, what it does is when you first connect it to your Ultra HD TV with HDR or something like that, it detects what that TV can handle. It's like, okay, this is a 4K TV. This is a 4K TV that can do HDR10, or this is a 4K TV that can do Dolby Vision. Um, Once it detects that, it says, okay, at what frame rates is that level of HDR supported? Is it supported only at 24 or 30 or 60? Whatever the highest is, so let's say it's 4K, Dolby Vision, 60 frames per second. That's what your TV can support. It'll automatically set itself to output everything at that. Like, so you're watching something that's coming in at 1080p in standard dynamic range at 24 frames per second. The Apple TV is going to change that to a, a 4K Dolby Vision, 60 frames per second output. Um... <laughs> Because they said, we don't want your screen to flicker when it changes from one format to another or from one frame rate to another. Okay. But how about giving the user the option? That sort of makes a little bit of sense. A little bit, but I mean, I don't want SDR being converted to HDR. Um, I, I hear you. And yeah. I agree with you, but I think most people don't want their f- screens to flicker more than any There's of the that. stuff that you There's that, but I mean, set. let's let's say you that, because you can manually set it to just about anything you want, but right. let's say you manually set it to 4K HDR 10, 24 frames per second, because that's going to be the majority of my content, you say to yourself. Well, now even your menus and your games that you might play on it come out as that. Hmm. And you wouldn't want to play your games at 24 frames per second, so you would have to manually change it to something like... Talk about a clunky thing, but I mean, all of this can be changed with firmware and software updates and all the rest of it. So including adding Atmos support, but out of the box, there's some weird stuff going on with that Apple TV 4K. Mm. Okay. Well, I guess we keep our on that one. Grant. So Grant's in New Zealand. So that's yeah. exciting. There's no hurricanes there. So uh, they had the earthquakes not too long ago, though. So uh uh, it doesn't have to be disaster relief podcast today, but whatever. Grant. Grant's theater room is 13 and a half feet wide by 20, 21 feet long with a bit of extra, uh, a bit of an extra alcove in the rear left corner. He's installed two rows of seats. There's three feet of space behind the second row. And then the alcove adds uh, some more space beyond that, but obviously only on that one side. He, uh, and he initially set up for a 7.2.4 configuration. The alcove at the back uh, and the windows on the right led him to putting a surround and surround back speakers on stands. But he found that people would occasionally trip over or bump into the stand mounted speakers so he needed to move them from time to time which became a bit of a hassle decided to wall mount them instead the surround speakers ended up a bit farther back than he would like but he's been happy with the sound there's really only one logical place for a single surround back speaker though so he reduced the speaker count to 6.2.4 configuration sure makes perfect sense it does the pioneer lx 59 receiver allowed for this configuration and for a 7.1 dolby true hd or dts hd master audio it works just fine there's two surround back channels just getting down mixed to a single surround back channel but disappointingly if he uses at most dts x or the uh, the dolby surround up mixer or dts neural x the single surround back speaker is completely silent mm-hmm. so he says why do the new immersive audio formats demand two surround back speakers, or is this a limitation of the way his particular Pioneer receiver has implemented them? I, if I had to make a guess, I would guess it was because of the Pioneer, but I'm not, I don't know that for sure. Nope. Um, it, it actually says in a lot of AV receiver manuals, the minimum speaker configuration to support Atmos as well as the Dolby Surround Up Mixer to support DTS-X, as well as the DTS Neural X Up Mixer, is seven speakers. That that is the minimum that you have to have, that any speakers beyond the traditional 5.1 must be added in pairs. Oh, okay. And that includes your surround back speakers. So you can't add a single overhead speaker somewhere. You can't add a single surround back speaker to an Atmos configuration. It is a limitation of the format. Anything beyond 5.1 must be added in pairs. Uh, so it's not your Pioneer's fault. It's a limitation of Atmos. If there you want you surround backs, you got to have two. 
if there's no way to get immersive audio working with just a one surround back speaker, should you simply stick with 5.2.4? Or should you consider a speaker like the SVS Ultra Surround that can accept two speaker wire inputs and be used as a dual mono speaker in a single cabinet? Uh, well, I mean, there's no reason that you can't co-locate two speakers. That's almost exactly what THX yeah. recommends. If you already have two of them... Just Which he pull- does, because he already had 7.2. 2.4 going before so he already I, owns the speakers i i would just put two of them right next to each other i want to buy yeah. a new speaker for this uh and in fact my speakers are my surround back speakers are in a very similar situation uh, i would have put just one back there if i had i mean i could have just put one back there but i already had two speaker wires run and they are basically they are not three feet apart <laughs> they are maybe right, yeah. they are maybe two and a half feet apart they are very very close to each other so the tweeters are probably three feet apart from each other. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's it's fine. I, that's yeah. what I would do. I mean, you're yeah, already got the speakers. He's using these Q acoustic speakers, which are nice and compact and definitely wall mountable. And we can see that at the back of his room, he does have this alcove in the rear left corner. So the portion of the wall um, that is in front of that alcove comes right up over to about the middle of the room. So it's like right. right behind his middle seats. So he's like, okay, it makes sense to have a single surround back speaker there. Doesn't totally make sense to have two, but since he wants surround backs in an Atmos configuration and you do need the two speakers and you already have two Q acoustic speakers on hand, I'm like, you just mount them both to that central piece of wall. And, uh, and there you go. Yes, they're very close together, but that's okay. In your receiver, you have the option of saying uh, that your speakers are within a foot of each other, uh, two to three feet apart, or more than three feet apart. And you simply say, they're within a foot of each other. That's where they are. And that's okay. Mm-hmm. So he says he's using Q acoustic speakers and JBL in ceiling speakers. Are there any other dual mono speakers similar to the SVS Ultra Surround that would uh, better match? I, like we said, I think it would just stick with what you got. Yeah. Uh, I actually went looking for it. RBH used to make a speaker that did this too. Ah, uh, uh, that's right. Uh, I could not find the exact model number. Yeah. But it's it's quite, I mean, RBH speakers tend to be quite large. And I, I don't remember if they made a more compact version of it. So that would be an option, but you would have to find it. I mean, it would be used. You, you, I don't know if you would even be able to find it. But that is an option. Uh, you could always call them. Yeah, see. the the ones I knew, uh, Revels uh, Concerta S12 uh, did this, but that's a discontinued model because they're oh, now on the Concerta yeah. 2 series and they don't have an equivalent model to that. Yeah. Uh, Focal's Electra SR1000BE could do it, but it's a really expensive speaker. Is that a beryllium tweeter <laughs> that's in there? A, that's two beryllium tweeters yeah, in there. Yeah, you, that is, you could just redo all your speakers if you're going to buy that massive massive overkill so so out of all the ones that we've talked about the only one we know that you can still get today is that svs ultra surround but we both agree you've already got the q acoustic speakers on hand just mount both of them i know it might look a little bit odd but it It it, makes you feel better you can build yourself a little box of speaker cloth and just put it around there yeah Yeah, or you can you can put a little Instead of like mounting them directly, you could put a little shelf on that back yeah. section of wall and just sit both speakers on that little shelf. Yeah. You know, something like that. That's what I would do. Yeah. Uh, just for the sake of argument, could he feed both surround back channels into a single regular speaker? Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> that would be a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. No, you don't want to do that, dude. I, you can't put, if you put the two speaker wires into the same thing, the amp channels are basically connecting the amp channels. That's a short back. out. <laughs> yeah, you're, yeah. That, that, you will very quickly discover that that was a bad idea. Yeah. So. But just, just imagine, say, taking your front left and right speakers and taking the two black leads, the black lead from the left and the black lead from the right, and twisting them together. Yeah. Because that's essentially what you would be doing in this instance. So yeah, don't, don't do that. I don't know why I always start these podcasts by sitting on the foot, but mm. I can't feel it. Trying anymore. to look taller. No, I guess so. Yes. Have you been reading my Facebook? <laughs> I've been complaining about how tall my son has gotten. <laughs> He's taller than me. Jonathan. At Cedia, Jonathan says, Elac and Andrew Jones showed off the final versions of his new. A Dante series speakers, which mm-hmm. should be ready to ship soon. They're twenty five hundred dollars each for the towers and twenty five hundred dollars a pair for the bookshelves. The demos were strictly five point one using the twenty five hundred dollar, uh, which apparently is a theme. A Dante <laughs> ASW one two one. It's a dual opposed two by two twelve inch 
uh, drivers in a box. It's a sealed subwoofer for the 0.1 duties. That's I guess mm-hmm. so. If you want to buy anything from them, you're gonna buy them in. Twenty five hundred bucks a pop. Twenty five hundred dollars. That's the price. That's the price of all the things. So sometimes you get two things with that. Sometimes you get one thing with that. <laughs> so he asked, "Will Andrew Jones ever get on board with using two subs? Will five point two ever be considered the standard speaker com- configuration?" He's accepted putting uh, two drivers into one cabinet. So why not two cabinets with one driver each? <laughs> Uh, yeah, Jonathan, uh, I, I can't speak to what An- uh, Andrew Jones believes or does not believe, or nor do I uh, really think that 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 he's opposed to two uh, subwoofers. I think that many manufacturers and designers, for that matter, uh, think of home theater more practically than maybe you and I do. You know, a mm-hmm. lot of people out there are that. are having a hard time uh, getting people to just buy the single sub, much mm-hmm. less the dual sub. So, uh, you know, why wasn't he? Why didn't he have two subwoofers in there? I don't know, dude. I don't know. Yeah, in in the interviews and the videos uh, that I've seen Andrew Jones uh, talking in, um, the, the, he hasn't he hasn't gotten on board with the multiple subwoofer thing just yet. He's still talked about. Um, you know, using full range speakers in every position. He he just, he hasn't, hasn't gotten on board with that whole thing. And, and will he, I think he needs, I think he needs a a really good demo from, from Sean Olive and Todd Welty and the other folks over at Harman. Um, You know, I I think, I think as soon as he hears it, he'll, he'll be a believer (laughs) because that's how it works for Tom and me and for everyone else who's ever listened to our advice on this podcast and gotten on board with the, at least two subwoofers across the room from one another um, and what a difference that makes and what an improvement it is. So hearing is believing. Um, I, for whatever reason, I guess he hasn't had a convincing demo of that done just yet. Uh, So yeah. I don't. I don't think he's. A, he seems like a very reasonable man. I don't think he's immovable on this topic. So somebody's just got to get a hold of him and give him a good demo. That's what I right. think. Right. And you know, a lot of times these guys, and this is it's not uh, disparaging. It's just the fact of life. At some point, you're like, listen, I've been doing this a long time. I don't. I know what I know. I don't need anybody to tell me anything new. I'm like, I. I think that's a fairly ignorant and uh, dismissive point of view but it's something I understand <laughs> because I've, I've heard it all my life yeah. you know as, as I've been walking around with people who clearly uh, are experts in their fields they're also uh, wildly uh, uninformed as to the, some of the newer things that are going on this happens a lot in colleges too where mm-hmm. you've got uh, professors who have been do, you know teaching the same class for 30 years you know they have sometimes no idea some of the stuff the newer stuff that's out and you end up getting outdated information from them i okay i think i've told the story before but i'm gonna tell it again real quick my grandfather we're not even gonna get through all 10 of these questions there's not just zero chance my grandfather one time said to me as we were driving along he goes man soap's weird how does soap work he just kind of said off off the cuff i was like I just had a chemistry class today. So this is how soap works. One half of the molecule uh, dissolves in water, one half of it dissolves in oil. And then when you mix it together in, with a, an oil and water, and there's oil in your hands, and that picks up all the dirt, and then you clean your hands, it comes. And then I explained this whole thing to him, and he's like nodding his head. Uh-huh, uh-huh. At the end, he goes, yeah, but how does it work? That was a man who clearly did not want to know. He was done. His brain was full of all the information he needed to know to get through life, and this was not a a thing he wanted to expand upon. That very moment, I made the decision that I would never be like that. I would always <laughs> learn. I would always want to learn. So maybe Andrew Jones has gotten to the point where he doesn't want to learn anything else about home theater or speaker design. I and that's think between, that's the case. But... I'm not saying that it is. I said maybe it is. I and think part it, of the problem is the is the channel count thing because the logic says we have this point one channel. You play that from one subwoofer, uh, and even like we're guilty of doing this whole calling it. 5.2 or like in Atmos calling it 5.2.4 or 7.4.4 or something like that. That's really a misnomer because 
that's really point just one, one. It's just point one. It's it, it's all point one. It's just that you're using four, two or four subwoofers to all simultaneously play one channel. Now we've gone over and over why that works, why that's beneficial, why you want to do that, and really it shouldn't be that hard to wrap your head around because for any of the given speaker channels, most speaker designers are using more than one driver. Not that guy who talks on HT guys all the time, but. Uh, <laughs> Most most of them are like, yeah, you divide up the frequency range. It's one channel, but I'm using three or five drivers to produce the sound from that one channel. It isn't that difficult to wrap your head around the idea of using more than one driver to produce the sound from the point one right. low frequency effects channel. Um, but yeah, it's it. I think there's it's yeah, it's ingrained thinking. It's a slight logic problem. You have to get away from what's intuitive because the whole multiple subwoofer setup thing is not intuitive. It really is not, which is why we've managed to continue talking about it this many years in because people are still like, I can't quite wrap my head around it. I know, we get the same questions over and over again, but you're right. It's like, and we're fine with that. That's That's fine. That's great. We will, we will keep at it because all we have is the example itself of, oh yeah, that actually works much better. So yeah, that's, that's all we got. So Jonathan says they made a point of saying that speakers come with gloves so you can unpack them and position them without getting fingerprints on the glossy finish. But isn't that kind of indicate a problem? If the speakers are visibly visible and positioned out uh, in the room and the finish is so delicate that you need to put gloves on to touch it, isn't that the kind of a war isn't that kind of a worry for day to day use? And if you've hidden them behind acoustically transparent cover, what well, does it matter if these fingerprints are on the cabinets? With inclu- <laughs> with the will the included gloves even fits the hands of Jonathan of Jonathan's many servants that he will have That's right. placing his speakers for him. Um, White gloved butlers. The white, the white glove, the the glove thing is such a crock of crap. I'm gonna be honest with you. <laughs> I've got, I've gotten that before. If you want to know a surefire way to break your brand new speakers mm. as you take them out of the box, put on those gloves. The cotton they gloves. are like frictionless surfaces. You know, the, the, I, I remember one time taking a, a, a tower speaker out of the box. I took the, I I, I, pu- I pulled at the speaker and the thing just went. Zoom! Slid yep. right back, right through my hands, back in the box. I was like, "Oh my god, I was dangerous." Especially when the speaker comes in like a cotton sleeve or something. Oh, the whole thing yeah. is like trying to wrangle up a, a, a seal. It's yep. terrible. So uh, it is a such a load of crap. It's just uh, audiophile nonsense. These things are so nice. You have to have the white glove finish. Shut mm. up. That's like ten cents worth of gloves, so that people think, "Well, these must be fancy if they come with gloves." Yeah, no, it's pick a it up with your tool. hands, place it, and then if there's fingerprints on it. Wipe it with a microfiber cloth and you're done. Most glossy speakers come with microfiber cloths anyways. And there's just one in the box. You just wipe it down. It's no big deal. Uh, I don't know about your servants and the size of the other hands. That's between you and your servants. You guys should discuss that. Maybe get them their own gloves, preferably with some grip to them. He said one of the included accessories that comes with the Adante center speaker, which is $2,000. Oh. It's the odd man out. What? It's $2,000. It's like, well, how do you charge $2,500 for a single center speaker that isn't as large as the tower? That's what he had to do. <sighs> had to ruin it. Anyways, it comes with a rubber wedge. Is this that basically just a rubber doorstop? It seems a bit low tech for such an expensive speaker, and not as adjustable as say the Oralex Mopads. Would we have expected something a bit more elegant for adjusting the tilt of the center speaker? That's exactly what the um, uh, the Grands, the uh, the, Varus Grands? Came, the Varus Grands came with with these two little wedges, and they they're kind of like a scoop, like a like a like a quarter pipe on the thing. So it, the further up you put you push these things up onto the, to the wedge the more angled it is and it, it, it gets it's not it's not just a straight line it just it gets it even more angled i like them i i think they're fine uh i i've i've, I've dealt with a number of different center s- speaker solutions and it's this one uh, while maybe not as elegant as you might like it is <laughs> one that actually works like i've had some yeah. that that are like in the, this tiltable you know, sort of stand that comes with and yep, everything yep, else. Yep. And in the end, you're like, every once in a while, you have to go readjust it because it the vibrations will make it fall back down. So, Well, I'll tell I you, like, like the, 
like the Revel Ultima speaker, the Revel Ultima center speaker. I mean, it comes with a very nice looking, very fancy looking cradle, uh, but you adjust it like you have to adjust, you know, like screw things and like, you know, move. And it's a heavy speaker, so you get it in position, you screw it all back in, and then that all has to be put onto its dedicated stand and stuff. I'm like, it's a hassle and a half. And if you then want to adjust it afterwards, you got to like disassemble the stand basically in order to yeah. move it again. I'm like, I would rather have a rubber doorstop. That's very effective and much easier so i'm i'm fine with that how often are you looking under like getting down and looking underneath your center speaker to see what's tilting it up i'm fine with the black rubber yeah bill first up a few months ago we recommended some kef q series speakers to bill his front left and rights are now q uh kef q 700 towers and he loves them his Bye current bye. setup is a 7.2 system with a Denon AVRX 3000 receiver. He wants to upgrade to 7.2.4, and he was planning on getting either an AVR X4300H or the new X4400H. Those can both process 11 speaker channels, but they only have 9 amps built in, so we clearly mm -hmm. need some external amplification. All true. So can he use his existing X3000 receiver to power the front left right towers while the X4300 or X4400H powers the other nine channels? Does it have, it should, I see no reason why he can't do this. Why, you why, absolutely can't. Why, why, I can't imagine a way that this doesn't work. You plug it into just about any analog input. Any stereo input, like the CD input, for example. Select yeah. that on your, select that as your uh, source, put it into pure direct mode, turn your volume dial to zero, never touch it again. Correct. You're done. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, you can totally use your X3000. It is large box. As a, as, a, as a basically a dumb amplifier. But yep. yeah, you're only talking about powering two channels. So you take the pre-outs for your front left, right. Now, in your... Uh, X30 or uh, X4300 or X4400, whichever one you decide to get, um, you do have to tell it. Uh, you say, okay, I've got nine amps. That means two of the 11 speakers must be powered externally. But there is the option. Which two must be powered externally? Front, left, right is one of those options. There you so go. So that's what you're going to choose. You're going to say my front, left, right must be powered externally. You're going to use the front, left, right pre-outs from the X4300 or X4400. Put them into the stereo analog input, any stereo analog input of your X3000. Select that as your source. That's it. Now your X3000 is just an amp. He says if the X3000 is powering the front left and right towers, can you configure it to buy amp them? That is absolutely 100% true. That, and it's just a selection, right? And then you yep. run two speaker cables. From yeah, so your X3000 does have the ability to have a buy amp mode. So in your X3000's setup menus, you'll need to say... I have a bi amp setup, and what it'll do now is your front, left, right binding posts. I check your manual because I'm not yeah. sure if those ones are supposed to go to the tweeter input or the. It doesn't actually matter because it's actually sending full range out of both of them. Say, yeah. But your front, left, right binding posts will connect to one set of binding posts. Make sure you remove the metal jumper from your Keft towers. Yes, because they come with a metal jumper pre-installed. Remove that metal jumper, but you plug the front, left, right binding posts into one set of binding posts on your towers and then it'll be the ones that are labeled surround back slash assignable those ones will get wired to the other pair of binding posts on your towers and now you have bi amped your front left right towers with your x3000 yay so he says what's the best way to take advantage of his older x3000 if he doesn't end up using it for uh bi amping his front towers well i think you're gonna I think you are too, but uh, uh, zone, another room at your house with yeah. other speakers, I guess. Uh, garage system, outside thing, maybe. I don't know. Sure. Paperweight. Or, I mean, if you, just, if you just decide that for some reason you don't want to power your front left rights with them, you can still use it to power one of the other pairs of speakers. Like the X4300 and X4400 are very flexible. You can say, what, what are the two speakers that must be powered externally? Pick some pair, and uh, and you could use the X3000 to power those. So you're like, I'd rather have it power my front height speakers if you have them. Okay, make it that instead. That's another use. <laughs> yeah, I mean... It could, I it's mean, still it, just using it as an amp, though. No different. Yeah, yeah. Jeff. Jeff completed his upgrade to his 7.2.4 Atmos uh, setup last winter. His room is 20 feet long and 15 feet 
15 and a half feet wide and nine, a little bit over nine feet tall. Although there's a soffit that runs around the entire perimeter of the room, so the ceiling height is eight feet underneath the soffit. Okay. So, so. he did send us a diagram, and what this is is looking at the front wall. So oh. this isn't like a layout of the room. It's like the ceiling is actually the top of the image. The left okay. wall is the left of the image. The floor is the bottom of the image. So this is this is as though you are in the seat looking toward the front of the room. That's that's the diagram that he sent us. But we can okay. see that he does have this soffit on the left and right part of the ceiling. So it's actually eight feet to the bottom of the soffit. And then the center portion of his ceiling is taller than that. It's nine feet, four inches. All right, so he followed Dolby's guidelines and installed his front height and top middle speakers the same distance apart as his front left and right speakers. In this case, that's 10 feet apart. Mm -hmm. So he finds that top middle speakers don't really sound like they're directly overhead. They're so far apart, they end up being about 45 degrees to, uh, to either side of his primary seat. The fronts of the uh, Ascend CR2s and the front heights and top middles are Ascend HTM 200 SEs. There's a lot of crawling around this attic and going up and down to a ladder to install the top middle speakers. So this is a trivial thing, a trivial thing for him to move them or experiment with their placement. On top of that, he has acoustic treatments on the ceiling in the form of two foot squares. Okay. So what's the solution? Should the top middle speakers actually be closer together? If so, should he put them where his existing ceiling treatments allow, meaning they'd only be about five and a half feet apart instead of 10 feet apart? Or should he remove those two absorption panels in order to reposition the top middle speakers? Could anything, uh, could anything else he could do to improve his Atmos sound? Let me look again. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of a tricky one because he actually followed our advice and had them point straight down. Right. And he's like, okay, they're up there, but I'm not getting what I've described several times, which is if you have the top middle speakers, that they tend to be the most noticeable of any of the overhead positions as like, hey, that's directly above me. That He chose them because he wants that effect. He's like, I know myself. I want to be able to tell that that sound is coming from straight right. above me. Right. So uh, totally fair enough. Followed our advice, unfortunately, not giving him the results that he was hoping for. Well, uh, I would try angling them. <laughs> I hate to yeah. say it. That's the first. <laughs> yeah. That's the first thing I would do before I even thought about doing anything else. I would angle them. Yeah. Now, how are you going to do that? I don't. Yeah, it depends know. on how he's mounted them as <laughs> yeah. well, right? If he has flush mounted them in such a manner that they're they don't have angling capability, it's going to be a big hassle to change yeah. them to something that can, right? Yeah, and that's sort of uh, that's a, sort of unfortunate. Yeah. Um, even if you were to just like, do you have two children? and two ladders <laughs> or two step stools like could you just get somebody to stand up there with these two top middles and just unhook them from the wall and mm. just point them towards you and then play something that you know goes overhead that isn't giving you the effect that you want could could you do that if so then you are basically two speaker mounts away from being happy and yeah i mean he, he was saying that like the the sounds that come from the front heights uh, because he's got a pretty good distance to his yeah. front wall, um, that he's finding even with the front heights mounted 10 feet apart, that they sound okay to him. Yeah. Um, those ones he said he, he has them angled like downward, but he didn't tow them in at all. Right. So they're sort of angled, which makes sense with front heights, that they'd sure. be you know, sort of angled downward. Um, but he's like, yeah, that effect sounds fine. It's just the top middles, it seems like they're so far to his left and right that he's not getting the sense that they're overhead. Now... A lot of people will have a setup where their front left and right speakers are only six feet apart, seven yeah. feet apart, something like that. Uh, so having the top middle speakers closer to one another is certainly not out of the question. Five and a half feet, though, seems very close to each other. Yeah. Uh, and I totally get it. It's like you already have these right. nice absorption panels installed. It would mean either taking two of them down, which wouldn't be the end of the world. No. Um, but it would either mean you know, taking them down or it ends up with the top middles are considerably closer together. I would try angling them, dude. <laughs> I, I think yeah. angling is going to be the solution that you're going to be most you're going to be happiest with, and if you can't, then you're going to have to move them close to, closer together. But yeah. five and a half feet is awfully close. Again, I would not do anything without testing it first. At this point, yeah. you don't you don't yeah. want to do anything that you're going to 
end up really regretting. If that yeah, means g- like given... literally just splicing together some more speaker wire off of what you've right. got up there and then moving them over and just hanging them from a hook or something, you know, which, whatever you're hanging your speaker, I mean, your uh, absorption panels from, just, mm-hmm. you know, putting them up there. I don't know how heavy those things are. They might be heavier than that. Uh, yeah, I mean, the HTM 200 SEs are, uh, they're, they're compact, but they're like, they're like little bricks, you know, yeah. they're not, they're not the lightest things. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, since it's going to be a hassle for you to reconfigure this, no matter what, I would just add slightly more to that hassle and find a way to temporarily test them. It's unfortunate uh, because, I mean, he's following the recommendations and his yes. recommendations, uh, and he's done everything right. And it would have been yes. our recommendations too, though. And maybe and, it was our maybe what maybe it was our recommendations, but I often and I think I've said this on the podcast a number of times is have been recommending people cheat them in a little bit here and there because especially if you have a big wide screen yeah. and you have this ma- like I do this massive this massive spread, spread. like my yeah. speakers are almost on the side walls and if yeah, I yeah. put if you, Dolby if you Atmos, top middles yeah. and they were the same distance apart they'd be practically on your side walls yeah. yeah which means I would cheat them in anyways I'm gonna if I hopefully I will do some Dolby Atmos in here once I get all this stuff set up and I'll get some more uh, prime elevation speakers because that'll be the easiest way right. for me to do it. Since I yeah, can't mount them the like ceiling. high up on your sidewalls and yeah. call them top middles. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, he was saying, is there anything else he could do? And I'm unfortunately, the only other thought I have is since your front heights have worked out, you could sort of replicate that at the back of your room, right? Instead of top middles, you yeah, have rear true. heights or top rears because you're like, the front heights actually work out so there's no reason to think that rear heights wouldn't also work out. But then, like he's like, obviously he chose top middles because that's where that's he wants. He the, wants, he wants yeah. the sensation that it's coming from above him. So yeah, really, you you do need to either angle them at you or get them close together. I would say five and a half feet is a little bit too close together, right. which now means taking down those panels, getting them say six and a half feet, seven feet apart. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate. You're, you're actually getting the sound that's kind of intended. If you go to a full size Dolby Atmos cinema, right? Uh, you don't really get the sound like it's oh, it's directly above me. It's pretty diffuse because they're so high up there, right? Um, so you're actually going for a. You've probably got a sound that's quite similar to the full size cinema. It's just you desire a slightly different sound which is fine i totally understand that but it does mean getting a little bit away from dolby's recommendations which they gave to try and recreate what they're doing in their own cinemas that's how that's how we ended up here infinite gary when looking at pre and post calibration results we often see graphs for grayscale that show the delta e errors and also show red green and blue as horizontal lines gary understands that getting the delta e all below three is the goal and that it's supposed to be imperceptible to the human eye but even with very good numbers the horizontal red green and blue lines never perfectly overlap so mm-hmm. why not and what would it take or what is the limitation in current displays that prevents them from having no error at all? <laughs> well, now this this is worrying about something you don't need to worry about. Yeah, but we get it. We're yeah. totally geeky. We we understand where this is coming from. But yeah, Gary does understand. It's like this isn't actually going to be perceptible to your eye, right? So we're not we're not super worried about it. But why? Yeah, fair. So enough. in the end, you know, when we look at these little these these are just slight variations and imperfections in the color reprodu- re- reproduction mm-hmm. and i mean this is from you know my perspective it's all hardware you know there's only so perfect it can be there's just so many little imperceptible not imper- well, they are imperceptible but it's uncontrollable variables yeah. that we are you know not every single pixel is exactly the right perfect thing every single time not putting up the exact amount of light supposed to and it's maybe decaying slightly slow you know faster (laughs) than something else you know this just you know what's it going to take perfection and we don't have that so it's it's never going to happen so i mean a great a great example uh vincent Tio put up a video where he got to bring into his own house one of the sony bvm reference studio monitors it's an OLED display. It's 30 inches diagonal, so it's pretty small. <laughs> and, it, and it costs $30,000. Okay? And it has these little teeny pot dials on the front to adjust the colors very, very precisely. And if you're actually using it in a studio, you're required to recalibrate it every week 
Hmm. That's that's one of the requirements for uh, creating. So if you want perfection in the colors, that's what it costs. That's how small the screen is, and that's how often you have to calibrate it, <laughs> which is not a user friendly thing. I wonder at, how. I mean, I I wonder if those lines absolutely overlap, though. Yeah, even then, right? Yeah. yeah. So I mean, in, I, I would like to a... see that graph <laughs> well, before I believe it. I well, given what Vincent Tio measured and what he showed, he's like, he's like, he, I've never seen it this perfect, and I believe him. He's a professional I it too. calibrator. And there's a reason why, but there's a reason why it's that small and it costs that much and it has to be re calibrated that frequently yeah um so i mean you know the example that that gary showed and this was from a uh, from a projector and this was pre and post calibration that we're showing in the video and it's like originally it was like in the low end too much red in the high end not enough red right and post calibration pretty even out. but yes the red green and blue lines do not perfectly overlap and we see that the delta e errors are all below two in this case so that's a very successful calibration but those lines aren't perfectly overlapping now part of that is the adjustment capability of the display because they're That's just using true. the user level controls. And uh, we actually mentioned this last week when Gary asked about lookup tables. But in a normal consumer display, you'll have maybe a two point or at most a 20 point, a lot have a 10 point adjustment of the colors, which means that you can only adjust, uh, essentially add an offset to the color uh, at say 10 or 20 different points along um, a signal that can have as many as 1,024 values. Right. So by going to a full lookup table where you can adjust every single one of those 1,024 values individually, you could get closer. You could get closer to having all of those lines completely overlap, but it wouldn't last for more than a week, just like the professional display doesn't. Uh, you know, so that's an awful lot of work for something that quite literally is not even perceptible to your eye. Right. So, but, you know, fair enough to ask on the technical side. But if you want to get like a welder's helmet and strap this thing to the front of it, <laughs> to take off the mask and strap this thing to the front of it, you'll get that nice field of view and it'll be absolutely perfect. Now, you'll have to sit very still in your room so the sound lines up and you'll somehow have to figure out how to make that an acoustically transparent display. That might be a challenge. Brandon. Brandon just upgraded to a Denon AVR X4300H. Hey, so did I. Uh, he has some questions about the Odyssey Multi-Q XT32. After right. ha having run Odyssey, he kind of wants to tweak the volume level of his subwoofers. Mm -hmm. If he adjusts the volume dials on the backs of his subs or adjusts the trim levels on his X4300H manually, does he then have to rerun Odyssey again? If you do, it's going to set it back to where it had it before. <laughs> so it's going to undo it's gonna, what you just right. did, basically. Okay. If you're, if you run Odyssey, you mm -hmm. say, wow, this sounds really good. I would still like some more bass. There mm -hmm. ain't nothing wrong with that. Okay. That is perfectly fine. Goose the bass, mm -hmm. go on with your life. Yep. Don't worry about it. If you run Odyssey again, Odyssey is going to be like, who turned the bass up? Knock it back down. <laughs> that's, that's what it's going to do. Yep. <laughs> because that's now, its job. There's one other slight wrinkle in this, which is that the X4300H can work with the Odyssey editor app. Which you could then just do it in Odyssey as well. So if you wanted to, if you're like, hey, what Odyssey gives me by default, I would enjoy a little bit louder bass, which is totally fine. You could pay the, I think it's $20 20 still bucks, yeah. for the Odyssey editor app. And that lets you manually set your target curve. Uh, in the app so there that you would just say okay make make my base a little bit louder that's the new target i want you to aim for and then you would rerun odyssey for that uh you know given this new target curve that it's aiming right. for and that would that would uh increase your base level that way so that's an alternative but honestly there's absolutely nothing wrong with just going on the volume dials or using the i would recommend using the trim level myself i would too that's what i, I would suggest using yeah. is the trim level so if he does tweak the volume dials or the trim level, does that throw off Odyssey's EQ adjustments? Will it make everything incorrect? Yes. It's exactly what you're doing. <laughs> that is <laughs> well, literally exactly yeah. what you're doing. You are changing. So it made everything as correct as it could. Then you made it less correct. That doesn't make it bad. It just yeah. means that it is now, when it, when it thinks it's, you know, it, it's making things even, it's making things even, but it's going to have slightly more bass because you adjusted the bass up a little bit. But this is a linear offset. Right. So, so if it's you're talking like, about, yeah, yeah like, like the EQ, which is, okay, the EQ came in and said, okay, you actually have a bit of a hump in your frequency response here. So 
it just in those frequencies that have this hump, I'm going to reduce their level as part of the equalizer. That doesn't change. All you've done is taken that setting and now linearly moved the whole thing up. Yeah, right? which is what so you it, wanted to do in the first place. That's right. So, so it's fine. It's the, the equalizer still got rid of that hump that shouldn't be there. You're still getting a flatter line. It's just you've moved the entire line upward, making the whole thing louder. That's fine. So you yeah. didn't you didn't damage the equalizer. It's no longer correct in the sense that it's no longer matching the original Odyssey target curve, but it's matching the shape of the curve. You've just moved the whole thing upward in the base. That's yeah. fine. So if he's manually changing the subwoofer's volume levels, do they still need to be level matched? Does he need to check that with this uh, separate SPL meter? If they do need to be level matched, how does he accomplish it? Now, they're already level matched. They've been level matched. And if you yes. adjust the trim and not the volumes on the back, because it, this is the dangers of adjusting the volume on the back. Once you move that knob, you will never get it back to where it was before. And you <laughs> yeah. don't know that you're moving them both the same amount. So just adjust the trim levels because the yes. subs have already been leveled by Odyssey and Denon. And now you are just giving them a little bit more juice from the receiver's end, which is means that they're going to be the same volume relatively when the, at, at yeah. your seat. Yeah, so since you do have uh, the two separate subwoofer outputs, uh, I'm assuming that's what he's used in this instance, you go to subwoofer one, you move its trim level up three, four, or five decibels, something like that. Right. And you also move subwoofer two's trim level up the same amount. Right. They're still level matched. You've just moved them both up equally. And that that's, again, why I was saying I also favor doing this in the trim level rather than the physical volume knobs. So what about, say, adjusting the trim level of a center speaker? Would that throw off all these EQ results or is it no big deal? Yes. <laughs> throws it off well but it's okay but in the same in the same, in the same way, way. Yeah. no but you, do you see where we're going here you are now adjusting most of your speakers up a little bit i think you just want it louder in which case well, just turn no, it louder because i mean a lot of people want the center speaker in particular louder than relatively louder than the front left right because it helps the dialogue be a little bit clearer a lot of people like that little extra goosing in the bass that's really really common so. I'm just saying he's pretty close to just he's one he's one more set of speakers away from just going just turn the whole thing up just turn the whole thing so up. any reason to <laughs> manually adjust the distance settings why might someone ever need or want to do so there is no reason for you to ever manually adjust the distance setting why would you want to do so if you do not have a phase knob on the back of uh, a yep. sub you could use the distance setting to essentially accomplish the same thing yep but you don't need to so don't worry about no. it. No, don't, don't. <laughs> no. In your in don't. your case, there's really no reason to to go manually messing with that. Uh, and you might notice that, that, it, that again, the since distance it's, to your subwoofers is like yeah. outside of your house. If you're yeah. like, what is going or, on? Or it set them to three feet, even though you know they're physically ten feet away from right. you or something. That's entirely possible. Y you shouldn't see something like that in your speakers. No. Your speakers should be set close. very close to their actual physical distance away from you. But you might notice that your subwoofer one and subwoofer two are set to distances that don't match their actual physical distance away from you. That's okay. It actually probably knows better than you do. Um, yes. Because that is based on the acoustic different, uh, distance, not the physical distance. And with very, very long bass waves, that can be quite different from right. physical it's it's basically like a phase thing. I mean, it, it it, it's it's what a it delay. Comes down it, to. It's, it, a it's delay. literally a delay in the signal. Yeah. It's just don't worry about. It. Don't ever look at that number. That's the <laughs> important thing. Like I like it's one of those things. I wish they would just take it off of there. Like don't <laughs> don't touch the distance. Justin, not Bieber, again on Facebook. Justin says he has decided to keep his a two channel only music setup in a section of his open concept living room. Uh, this separate this is separate from his TV with surround uh, sound setup. So and he's no longer trying to figure out a way for his SVS subwoofers to try to pull double duty for both systems. I think he asked that last week. So he's, it wasn't last week, but it was a while back. Was it? Okay. Anyways, it these all run together for me. He's uh, using his uh, Emotiva Basox preamp and and a preamp and amp to run his RBH impression series R55 Ti towers. And now he wants a smaller, affordable. Uh, $350 or less 
a down firing subwoofer just to round out the bottom end. This is all in the same room, right? Uh, no is. pressurization expected, only one seat and music only. And the down firing request is because of their cat, who Justin says is a jerk, and will try to scratch anything forward firing or with a grill. So any suggestions? Yeah, get rid of the cat. Let's Aww. start with that. Hey. I don't like cats that much. I'm sorry. I, I, <laughs> I like cats. I, I like animals, and I like some cats. I am a dog person, though, like straight up. <laughs> but I like all animals, to be honest with you. But cats, let's be honest. If a cat was big enough, he would eat you. That's just, sure. That is just the truth. Dog, if you made a humongous dog, he would teleport you around if he could. But if he couldn't, <laughs> he would still just be just as nice uh, as he is. Did you actually right see now. the Inhumans? No. Launcher? No. It's not wasn't terrific in IMAX, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, who on God's green earth thought it was a good idea to take the pilot for a TV show and put it on IMAX? Plus, they cut out 10 minutes and you could really tell. Because <laughs> there was a jump in plot and logic where I was like, okay, I mean, I've caught up. I, I know what happened, but man, oh man, could you tell there was 10 minutes missing out of that thing. So 350, choice. we used to recommend the STF, whatever, whatever, whatever from HSU, but they don't have it anymore. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore. No more STF2 from HSU. Uh, no, I'm going to point to Outlaw, and I'm going to suggest their M8, which is $300. There so you it's go. under the budget that you wanted to play. Now, it is only an 8-inch drive, and it does only play down to 30 hertz, but there isn't a ton of content below 30 hertz in most music. What is he? What kind of speakers is he running in this thing? For this RPHs, thing, RPHs, the towers, they get pretty low, don't they? Not really. Like I actually really like their design because they use the big towers and all those drivers to be able to play super loud, but not really very mm. low. Um, that, I mean, that's been a criticism of it because people get that they're like, oh, look at the size of these towers. They must produce a ton of bass, and they're like, how come they don't produce much bass? It was like, well, because they actually designed them the way speakers ought to be designed, uh, <laughs> in my opinion. But uh, yeah, no, I can I can see them lacking a bit of that low end thump. Um, so yeah, I I would suggest the M8. It's it's down firing. It's the price that you want. It's nice and compact, uh, and it'll it'll get the job done nicely. Yeah, so that's 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 my suggestion. I don't have. I one. didn't have I, any others. I, I, I didn't get. Looking. I didn't get this far down on the question list. Yeah. I had too many. I was. Doing the other, the other nice thing about them is, uh, I'm pretty sure that that uh, Emotiva Base X uh, preamp does have a subwoofer output. But if, because I know that Justin likes to swap out his equipment a lot, mm -hmm. you know, it's just it's what he likes to do, which is totally cool. So one of the nice things about the uh, Outlaw M8 is it actually has speaker wire inputs for oh, the subwoofer nice. as well. So if you ever do switch over to a different two-channel preamp or amp or something like that, and you just need to use a speaker wire connection, you'd be able to do so with that particular sub. So. I, I think it fits the bill. Let's... Yeah, I'm trying to think. I can't think of any other $350 subs out there that spring to mind. Yeah, I mean, the only other ones I know are all forward firing, right? You got Emotiva's own S12, but that's right. forward firing. You got that uh, RSL Speedwoofer 10. It just because something is forward firing does not mean it has to actually. I mean, I guess it does. It's. I mean, you, you could. Make your own feet and aim it down. Yeah. <laughs> so that starts getting weird. <laughs> well, that, I, yeah, I don't really recommend that. So, yeah, forget it. Go with that. So he's been checking out Monoprice's new Monolith series products. We already know uh, the amps are made by ATI. The portable headphone uh, amp slash DAC looks an awful like a lot like Oppo's. Any idea <laughs> what OEM might be behind with the new uh, that new desktop amp? I'm looking at it. Hold on a second. Yeah, yeah. So they so they introduced uh, at Cedia uh, some new Monolith series products. Uh, they had two headphone amps. One is a portable headphone amp slash DAC, and the other one is a desktop headphone amp slash DAC. Um, so I don't know for sure at all. I, I really don't know. However, a little bit of speculation because one of the things they're including in there is Dirac Sense Surround which is uh, where actually actually asks about that. So maybe we'll just uh, talk about that right now. Dirac Sense Around is uh, Dirac's version of getting the sound out of your head when you're using headphones. Mm -hmm. So Justin asked, is that using like a head related transfer function type of processing or is it just, you know, the, the phase manipulation like the old um, headphone modes, you know, like Dolby headphone or something like that. Uh, so from what I know of Dirac Sense Around, that is based on head related transfer function type of measurements, right? So uh, the dummy head <laughs> type of thing where they're, mm -hmm. they're trying to simulate the head related transfer function that would be applied to a sound to get it to sound like it's coming out of your head. So it's Dirac's version of that. Uh, but in particular, Oppo and Dirac teamed up 
uh, particularly for Oppo's smartphones, which aren't really sold much in North America, but they're popular elsewhere in the world, uh, to bring direct sense around processing into Oppo branded smartphones. And they had this whole partnership. And I haven't really seen Dirac sense around in a whole lot of other things. So given that Justin's absolutely right. That portable headphone app slash stack looks a heck of a lot like Oppo's existing one. Is that and the this new... Sonica one? Is that what you're talking about? No, the Sonica DAC is is a separate Oppo thing, but they have their uh, HA2, I think it is now, um, or something like that. I forget HA2 what Oppo's. HA2 SE, it's like a portable one. I don't. S- yeah, that's their portable one. And they don't have a... Oppo isn't selling a desktop headphone amp anymore. Right. Um, so... The it, old one had a display on it, though, didn't it? This it did, have a yeah. This one doesn't have a display. It's less expensive. It doesn't have as many inputs and outputs as Oppo's previous uh, desktop headphone amp. But um, let's just say I really wouldn't be shocked to find out that Oppo is the OEM of both of those headphone amps slash DAX because... The whole Dirac sense around partnership thing, uh, just the overall look and design of them. I mean, the if you look at the back panel of this uh, it's exactly monoprice what I'm trying monolith. To do. <laughs> Where are the spec? Okay. Yeah, if if you look at the uh, monoprice monolith desktop uh, headphone amp, it's got like the same layout of like the RCA input, a pair of XLR inputs, and then the RCA input for the other side. Like that's exactly the same as Oppo's old desktop headphone yeah, the amp that they've half discontinued. Of it. It's, yeah, it's like the it's it's, it's similar it to looks, the bottom half it, of it. Yeah, so it's, there's there's definitely some things making me suspect that Oppo is the OEM here. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if that were the case, hmm. but I don't know. I don't know for sure. All right, uh, Model Price Monolith Headfire Headphone Amp includes uh, Dirac Sense Around Two. Yeah, that's that's is, what is that, I just Do we already talked about this? All right, that so I, I I, we're did, done yeah. with this guy. We're done. That's it. You're that's done it for this week for Justin. I was so busy looking at Oppo Amp, I didn't pay any attention. So Justin, <laughs> I, I hope I hope he helped you. <laughs> Brandon again on Facebook. Brandon's looking for a new AV receiver. I think you should get the X4300H. Uh, he wants a 5.2.4 configuration in this theater with a pair of Zone 2 speakers in another room. He also wants to be able to output the full HDMI signal to a second zone. That shouldn't be a problem with almost any mid-range receiver or higher right now. He's torn between the Yamaha RX A3070 and the new Marantz SR7012. There's also uh, the Marantz SR7011, which is significantly less expensive as current clearance price. What should he buy? Is there something significant that should make him lean either uh, Yamaha or Marantz? Would he be missing out on anything if he goes with a slightly older and less expensive SR7011? There's some there's some details to dig into with this. Okay, yeah. go ahead. You do that. Sure. So, okay, let's start with uh, the Zone 2 thing, right? Because he says he wants to be able to have Zone 2 speakers in another room. If you go with Marantz or Denon, because I actually kind of agree with Tom, like if, if you were looking at the SR7011, then the Denon X4300H is even less expensive than that and has all the same capabilities as okay. the Marantz SR. Now, maybe he was only looking at Marantz because he physically likes the way they look. I'm down which with that. is a totally fine reason to do this. Uh, but if it's purely about capabilities, that X4300H is out there from Denon with the exact same capabilities as the Marantz SR7011. Um, now, with the Denon and the Marantz models, anything that you're going to play out of Zone 2 must, must be, be analog. two-channel. Ugh. It doesn't have to be analog, but it has to be two-channel. Meaning from the source itself, it has to be two channel in order to play it out of zone two. And that goes for Heos as well, which is their built in uh, wireless whole house audio solution. The source itself has to be sending two channel only. You can't send a multi channel uh, sound source and play that out of zone two or from the Heos system in Denon or Marantz. Now, that's a limitation because if what you wanted to do was have your cable box playing in full surround sound in your theater and then replicate that same audio in a second zone, you're limited to two channel in right. both zones if you want to make that happen. So that's a real limitation. Now, the Yamaha. Uh, the RX A3070, or I'm going to also mention there's the A3060, which is the previous year's model where virtually nothing changed. <laughs> there's So if you can find the 3060 at a lower price, that's definitely a viable option too. Now there, it's kind of an interesting thing because you said you want to do 5.2.4 in your main theater. 
that means you have to configure it to have four overhead speakers, which means they, in Yamaha's parlance, they call it front presence and rear presence right. speakers. That's what the labels will be. That's the name that they've given it to. But that's the same as top front or and top rear, rear or right. front height and rear height. It's the same thing. Front presence, rear presence. If you are using four overhead speakers with the Yamaha a3060 or a3070 you no longer have zone 2 or zone 3 preouts available to you Ugh. it takes the preouts for zone 2 and zone 3 and uses the, those that processing to create your four present speakers so if you only had two present speakers you say your front heights or your front presence you could then have a zone 3 pre-out active but if you have all four overheads you no longer have any present speakers or uh, no longer have any zone speakers available to you so you couldn't do it with a physical wire but what you could use is yamaha's music cast yeah. system which is exactly what i think you should do because yamaha's music cast system which is their wireless whole house audio solution can actually take any audio format you can be playing dolby true hd with atmos extensions in your main theater in full 7.2.4 and still play that exact same audio source uh from the music cast system now it'll down mix it to two channel to play it out of any of the music cast speakers or music cast amplifiers but the point is you don't have to change what your source is sending your source can still be sending full surround sound, full immersive audio, full Atmos, anything. Music Cast will handle that. So that's actually what I think you should do because the hassle of having to always manually switch your sources to only send out two channel every time you want to use Zone 2 or Heos, to me, that's... Now, maybe you're only ever going to use a music source that's two channel anyway, so that could work. But I'm suspecting you want to be able to send your cable box audio or something to Zone 2. Uh, so for that purpose, I think Music Cast is the way to go. And I'd get either the RX A3060 or A3070 from Yamaha to do that. That's what I say. Okie dokie. <laughs> Carl. Carl picked up one of the new Apple TV 4K units, and he loved that it included a tester cable option to let you know if you need to upgrade your HDMI cable. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Anyways, his old um, Amazon Basics HDMI cable failed. So mm -hmm. while he was at the Apple store, he noticed a new ultra high speed HDMI <laughs> cable from Belkin. They claim it has bandwidth of up to 48 gigabits per second or gigaflops or something. Anyways, <laughs> so does that make it an HDMI 2.1 cable? Doesn't that make it, uh, can handle 8K or something? Was it 48? That would be 8K? the idea. I doubt that. Up, up to usually means like in a perfect world if you <laughs> held it just right and gravity was affecting the electron so it went down faster um yeah i okay can you yeah. see your apple tv 4k through <laughs> the, the, the the cable you currently have because if you can see it to tell you that it has failed i feel like it didn't fail uh, uh. i feel like it didn't and there's the being able to manually set what the Apple TV 4K is outputting, although everything will then come out of that one format that you select. God, that's dumb. Um, yeah, so there's a few things to unpack here. So first of all, and really importantly, there is no such thing as an HDMI 2.1 cable. It looks, I mean, they just came up with that stuff. Well, that no, it's ago. just that that is not a name of a thing, right? HDMI LLC has been fighting this incredibly losing battle this entire time. <laughs> but they really don't want the spec numbers included anywhere because the spec number is kind of meaningless. Yeah, They want manufacturers and everybody to talk about what features are supported because you can have... You can, you can be an HDMI 2.1 specification adopter as a manufacturer. You can put the latest HDMI chips into your device and then still not support anything that HDMI 2.1 has added to the specification. You don't have to support any of the new features. You have the chips, you have the licensing, 
but you didn't put in any of the new features. That's entirely possible. So they want you, they want to focus on what features are supported, right. not spec numbers, because the spec number doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mandate anything. Um, so cables are never supposed to be labeled as 2.0, 2.1, nothing like The spec number should never appear. If it does, it means they're going against the official licensing of HDMI LLC. So there's no such thing as an HDMI 2.1 cable. We have standard speed HDMI cables, high speed HDMI cables, and premium high speed HDMI cables. Those are the official names that that are no ultra sanctioned. premium X cables. Ultra high speed doesn't exist. <laughs> Belkin made that up. HDMI doesn't recognize anything called ultra high speed. There's premium high speed but not ultra high speed. They do recognize now something that is going to be labeled as a 48G cable. Okay. That's the official naming for a cable that supports 48 gigabits per second. That is a real thing. It's an official thing, but the name of that cable is 48G. So HDMI when they say cable. up to 48, they mean, well, we're pretty sure it could do it. If like you cry, Maybe. if and you I mean, put you know put it in the right conditions and that sort of thing. Monster uh, Cable has been doing their own testing and been showing the data rates that they've managed to pass through all their various levels of cables, yeah. and they've gone beyond forty eight gigabits per second yeah. in their own testing, and that's probably entirely true. That they, they have the can. gear to test they it. They have so the gear to test it. I mean, they may lie about it, but I don't see why they would because they've got the gear. We they, know. They, at Clint least they tend to not it. lie about that sort of stuff. I mean, they charge you a crazy, ridiculous overpricing for it, and it's totally not necessary for anything you're watching today. But when they say, we tested this HDMI cable and it passed 56 gigabits per second, it probably did. Yeah. I don't, I don't really doubt that claim. There's no reason to have it, but it didn't. So this whole thing being labeled ultra high speed, being called an HDMI 2.1 cable, neither of those things is a real thing. That doesn't exist. Uh, if it were a real thing, it'd be called a 48G cable. Um, now, you don't need that. That's for... Technically, okay, so technically if you were doing 4K resolution at 120 frames per second, but with no chroma subsampling, so with a 444 signal. Right, uh, all the bandwidth, all of then, the data. Then like, you might need to go above 18 gigabits per second, which is what premium high speed means. Premium high speed means 18 gigabits per second, but you'd have to go beyond 4K resolution at 60 frames per second, even with no chroma subsampling full 444 signal. You have to go beyond that to require more than 18 gigabits per second. Uh, the Apple TV 4K doesn't output anything above 4K 60 hertz, no chroma subsampling with HDR, lossless audio, all that stuff. But it doesn't it doesn't do that. It will not require the Apple TV 4K will not require anything beyond a premium high speed 18 gigabits per second cable. That's that's what you need if you want the maximum that the Apple TV 4K can do. I don't know what this Belkin thing is. You know, it's it's labeled itself with something that isn't officially sanctioned by HDMI LLC. That's that's what they've done there. All right. <laughs> And you thought we wouldn't get through the 10 questions, and we did. I worried about it, but yeah. there we are. We there managed. There we are. We managed. All right. So uh, once again, thank our listeners of the week. We're going to thank uh, Lemuel and Tony for going to www.avrant.com and cl cl clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link and leaving us a donation. Thank you, uh, Mark. I'm sorry. Thank you, Lemuel, and thank you, Tony. Yeah, Lemuel, Tony, thank you both so much for those donations. We really appreciate it. That money will go into our coffers to help pay for our hosting fees and uh, the ultra premium high speed cables we're going to be getting <laughs> for our lights to get the uh, electricity there faster. I actually kind of want you to get one of those uh, optical HDMI cables just just for uh, just for fun, just just so you can say you have it. What am I going to do with it? I don't know. Do you even need that length? How long do you actually need? Uh, well, probably about 20, 30, 15 to 20 feet, I would imagine. That's oh, if, I, if I go right, I have to go around everything. That's that's hard to justify then. Get, yeah. get one of those monoprice Cabernet active HDMI I'm not, HDMI not worried games. about any of that. I don't have a projector, and I have no intention of acquiring a projector that does 4K, so don't worry about it. <laughs> By the way, I did see the Elite Screens... Uh, acoustically transparent screen uh-huh 
uh, and I see what you're talking about with the weave. Okay. I can I see what you're talking about. It is totally not noticeable from, from a distance. From like ten feet away. Yeah. Yeah. It's it. I, I Clint has one, okay. and uh, it, it was a very nice screen. I asked him about yeah. putting it together. He's you know he said it was fairly easy. It was the stretching part at the very end was mm-hmm. the hard bit but he said he said he was really impressed with it but we we have had some people who are like i'm gonna be sitting closer than yeah. 10 feet and it's like yeah yeah i forgot about that i had that seen that i was like bit. i was like oh you've got an elite he's like and I, so i went up and took a real close look at it yeah, yeah the weave is noticeable i mean it's there yep. and the, the further back you get it's not so bad but you know about yep. six feet away you're like can of see it a little bit now yep, you won't yep, yep. it won't bother you all the time but every once in a while it will yeah. Was kind of my impression of it. I also want to thank Blaine and Nathan for talking us up to uh, both HSU and OPPO, uh, respectively. So thank you, yeah. Blaine. Thank you, Nathan. Yeah, Blaine, congrats on that uh, VTF3 Mark V HP purchase. I mean, that's a very nice sub. That's big. I wonder it's if he a, built a cardboard box. He did not he did build a card. He's did very excited, that, though. He's excited. And rightly so. That's a heck of a nice sub. And Nathan, thanks so much for trying to get OPPO to send us an Ultra HD Blu-ray player. I'll take one if they offer. Yeah. I'm up, I'm open to it. Lastly, we want to thank, of course, Mike and Mark. Mike, our listener, and Mark from Accessories for Less for uh, getting me a new receiver. We very much appreciate it, and uh, I can only say thank you. Yeah. Mike, thank you so much for setting that whole thing up in the first place. Mark, thank you so much for the generosity. And, uh, I mean, I'll just say I'm, I'm, I'm happy you ended up with the X4300H. I, I like. am, too. So, I'm there's very, no. I'm, there's no worries about it, no concerns. We know, know exactly what you're getting. I know. I'm very <laughs> super excited. happy about it. Last but not least, Ephraim, if you're out there in Puerto Rico someplace, stay safe, stay dry, get some power, and let us know how you're doing, dude. I am worried, and my wife is even starting to ask about you. Yeah. Uh, so, and I say that as she doesn't ever ask how Rob's doing. Because I'm doing fine. <laughs> Let's go with that. <laughs> I mean, how many horror stories are you hearing out of Canada these days? I mean, it's just, Not a lot. I mean, we we have our problems for you know. I don't want anybody thinking that you know Canada's like problem free or something like that. But uh, overall, we've been we've been doing kind of okay. So we're just kind of keeping our heads. You down. You guys are keeping your heads down. Don't, watch America self destruct. Don't don't that necessarily look over good. here too much. We don't we don't really need any negative attention. We'll just kind of keep trudging along. We're gonna do our, just we're gonna, we're gonna do us. us, America. You yeah. guys do you. All right. Just make sure that none of the things you're doing splashes over the borders <laughs> or we're building the wall. All right. For AV Rant, <laughs> it would be a huge wall. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's put it this way. It would either be, it would actually probably be a very small wall because to build it all the way across, <laughs> it would have to be very short. The rabbit wall, it's the rabbit a, fence that they put across a, Australia. It's a it's speed bump. That Between America right. and Canada. I mean, that, that, that's why we went metric. We just freak everybody out when they see the speed limit as they cross the border. That's, that's right. The number that's just right. jumps like that. We, we should just quickly mention question at avrant.com, right? You want your questions answered, send it to our email, that's question right. at avrant.com. Yeah, that's I'm sorry. This is the podcast that answers your home theater questions. So please send us your question at question at avrant.com. We'll put you on the podcast, and eventually you'll make it your own movie based out of it. If but once uh, Austin, huh? once Austin is oh, done, oh, I see. With the, all, everything is doing, you guys can make your own YouTube video with your name. I'm very much title. looking forward to him coming back to the topic list. <laughs> been, I'm sure he's very busy. Dude, I'm telling you, he has got so those subwoofers are so heavy. I think oh, I he know. might be in the ho- hospital at this point. It's a hernia. very possible. I mean, you could crush a foot. There's no question about that. Don't put the spikes on. I don't even think they send spikes. They don't do spikes. All right. For AV Rants, I'm Tom Antry. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something.